most respected guest speaker for the session, Dr. Karen Danilchuk, Professor Darling Kluka, Dr. Rosa, Dr. G. Kishore, Sujit, invited guests, and my dear friends. Indeed, it's an honor for Kalo India and Ministry of Youth Affairs to have such an eminent speaker, especially the, the president of WASM with us. A brief introduction is here. Dr. Karen Danichuk is a professor of sport management in the School of Kinesiology and associate dean academic of the Faculty of Health Science at the University of Western Ontario in London, Canada. Throughout her career at Western, Dr. Danichuk has also served as coordinator of intercollegiate athletics and undergraduate chair of the kinesiology. Prior to working at Western, she taught and coached at Hong Kong International School. Her research interests include sport participation, women's representation in sport, leadership and sport marketing. She's also been a leader in global sport management, professional organizations, serving as a former president, treasurer, and chair of the International Relations Committee of the Northern American Society of Sport Management, that is NASA. She's a founder and current president of the World Association of Sport Management, WASM, and also a founder and honorary member of the Asian Association of Sports Management, ASIN. She has been awarded the Earl Ziegler Lecture Award, that is NASM's highest scholarly honor, the GAT Patent Distinguished Service Award, and is a NASM Research Fellow. She was the Assistant Chief Administration of Team Canada for the World University Games in Sicily in 1997, Assistant Thank Coach you. of the Canadian Women's Golf Team at the World University Golf Championship in South Africa in 2008. And has, attended, and has attended the Swissu Games in Beijing in 2001 and Bangkok in 2007 in presentation capacities. She has been a competitive athlete and has coached tennis, squash, and golf at the university level. She holds some degrees from McMaster University, BP, that is Bachelor of Physical Education, the University of Western Ontario, she did a master's, and the University of Toronto. Throughout her career at Western, she also served as coordinator of intercollege athletics and undergraduate chair of kinesiology. Prior to working at Western, she taught and coached at the Hong Kong International School. Her research interests include sports participation, uh, women's representation. She has served as an advisor of numerous graduate students at the master's and doctoral levels. She has published extensively in a variety of international journals and has presented her research globally. She has delivered keynote address and numerous scientific conferences, including Taiwan, Japan, Thailand, South Korea, China, Malaysia, Colombia, Spain, Ireland, Argentina. And she's been a leader in global sport management professional organizations, serving as a former president, treasurer, and chair of the international relations of the NASA. Ma'am, there's a lot to speak. And in all this, on behalf of the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports, Government of India, Kalo India, and also from Sports Authority of India, lectured by National College of Physical Education, a warm welcome to you. And I request you to kindly start on the session. Ma'am, please. Well, thank you, Dr. Usha Nair, for that kind introduction. I'm delighted to be invited to be part of this uh, brilliant idea and initiative uh, that your uh, Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sport has um, provided uh, Lakshma by National College of Physical Education, uh, which, uh, as I understand, is the academic uh, wing of the Sports Authority of India. So thank you to those groups and Kilo India as well. And uh, welcome uh, to the physical education teachers and community coaches in India. I'm Delighted to be here, and I look forward to sharing some of my ideas with you this morning. Uh, this is uh, just a very brief agenda of the topics that I will be addressing, uh, starting off with just a, a general 
picture of what's happening uh, uh, globally uh, it, with respect to sport. I will talk about the sport structure in Canada along with some of the key organizations that work into the system. And then I'll move into talking about some of the Canadian physical activity guidelines and the various sports that are offered uh, by some of our agencies. I'll end my presentation just with a brief overview of the World Association for Sport Management. Uh, as Dr. Nair indicated in my introduction, I'm currently serving as president of that association and I'd just like to give you a few ideas of what that organization looked like. I know that some of you might have visited uh, Canada at some point over the years. Uh, these are very common images that uh, people associate when they think of our particular country. Uh, you'll see some of the beautiful lakes in the western part of our country in the Canadian Rockies. Uh, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police uh, are very unique to our country. You'll often see them uh, on horseback. Uh, Niagara Falls is uh, located approximately two hours from where I personally live. Of course, we hosted the Olympic uh, Winter Olympic Games in 2010 in Vancouver, and Whistler, British Columbia, the extreme west of our country. Uh, and uh, you'll note uh, and, and see some Canadian maple syrup there, which we're also quite well known for, uh, that uh, comes from our maple trees. And uh, during the late winter and early spring, uh, the trees are tapped for the maple syrup. And then you see the Canadian beaver, uh, which is one of our symbols. But looking at some of the images, most people think of Canada in terms of mountains and snow and cold weather. However, we have four seasons. Uh, we're in the, uh, the spring season right now and very warm temperatures, probably very similar today to what you are experiencing uh, in your part of India. So in terms of sports, uh, we have uh, activities that cross all four of our seasons. Just to provide a, a little bit of um, uh, uh, statistical facts uh, about our country, uh, which is important uh, when we think and talk about sports, leisure and physical activity. Uh, it's a very large landmass. Uh, it's the second largest country in the world. We're bordered by three oceans, the Arctic on the north, the Pacific on the west, and the Atlantic on the east. Uh, but south of us, we have the United States. So a very large uh, part of our population is very close to the U.S. border. Uh, most of the Canadians uh, live in cities that are in the southern part of the country. Uh, we are broken up into provinces and territories, so 10 provinces and three territories. And our population is actually very small, and I'll give you a quick comparison uh, to India uh, after uh, I just finish with this slide. But I think uh, what we're seeing is um, a huge increase in the number of foreign born people. So immigration is very, very high. Almost a quarter of our Canadian citizens are uh, or have been born in another country. And uh, that again is important when uh, we continue to think and talk about sport. Two major languages, but English is the most widely spoken. French is spoken in the province of Quebec and in a few of the other provinces in Atlantic Canada. So this gives you just a, a quick 
snapshot of the world and you can see where India is in relation to Canada. And just some geographical and population comparisons. Uh, Canada is approximately three times the physical size of India. However, the population is much smaller. We only have uh, close to 38 million people. And according to the statistics that I could find, your population is approximately 1.38 billion, uh, give or take. So that again has a huge impact on uh, sport, physical activity and, and leisure as does the geography. So again, look at the aspect that you're surrounded by water as we are as well. And sometimes that comes into play with the types of uh, sports that are offered. So many factors and I've just uh, given you an indication such as geography, uh, the environment, the economic situation, uh, the demographics uh, do have an influence on leisure, sport, and physical opportunities in all countries. And take, for example, dragon boat racing. Uh, most of us think of dragon boats on the water and racing, and I had an opportunity when I lived in Hong Kong uh, in the mid-1980s to uh, participate in the annual dragon boat race. Uh, we have dragon boat racing on the water in Canada, but this is a good example of uh, adapting a sport to the environment because we have an annual winter festival in Ottawa, which is our national capital, and the dragon boats are actually on ice on the frozen Ottawa River. And instead of using paddles to propel one through the water, uh, in the sport of curling on ice, uh, the implement that is used to project the rock is called a curling broom. And the curling brooms are used to propel the dragging boat on the ice. So I thought this is a very unique example of how sport can be adapted to the environment. I think this is a, a fairly easy um, question to answer because again, most people um, associate Canada with winter sports. And as I indicated, that's not necessarily the case, but uh, certainly, uh, the game of ice hockey is considered our official national winter sport and it is played uh, by men, women, boys and girls of all ages. This is a little bit uh, more difficult to come up with the correct answer because it's not actually the sport that has the highest participation in the summer. Uh, this particular sport is linked to our Indigenous and Aboriginal background and the sport being lacrosse. Now, depending on what statistics are used and what uh, database or survey is done, uh, some could argue that the fastest growing sport at least a few years ago was actually the sport that you are very familiar with uh, being cricket and you'd ask well why would that be the case and uh, the response to that would be we have a huge influx of people coming and moving to Canada from various other countries around the world and cricket of as we know, is an extremely international uh, and popular sport. And through the interest of individuals who have moved to Canada over the years, it has become extremely popular and a lot of interest, even at uh, the very um, young age um, 
of getting kids involved with the sport. So we do have a national sport organization. We have um, uh, national teams as well. Our 10 most popular sports, uh, both in 2018-19, as well as this past year, 2019-20, our uh, ice hockey, soccer and lacrosse usually switch off. I would say it's uh, more likely to be soccer than lacrosse. Uh, we can play both soccer and lacrosse indoors, so they're not just um, during our, our summer months. Of course, we've got these other sports and you can see where uh, cricket does fall almost in the middle of the pack. And it's not until we get down to curling uh, that uh, that along with ice hockey are considered um, winter sports. Personally, I spend um, a lot of time. Uh, I'm a huge believer in daily physical activity. So I'm doing something every day during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic situation. Most of uh, our clubs have been closed. Recently, our golf courses have opened just two and a half weeks ago. Uh, but for the last few months, I've been cycling every day, going for walks. Uh, when we're outside of this COVID situation, I play a lot of golf, racket sports are my competitive background where I've coached uh, tennis, squash, and badminton, started as a competitive swimmer. I do take advantage of the snow that we have during the winter. Um, I like to downhill ski, uh, cross-country ski, and, and snowshoe. We have the opportunity to do that um, during our winters here. Uh, with the the snow that we get. Uh, not always a good year for cross-country skiing and snowshoeing, so sometimes um, we can find better areas outside of uh, the local regions. Now, where I teach uh, the university, you can see a very small X on that map of Canada, and it is in the city of London, so not London, UK. Uh, our city has uh, approximately 450,000 people uh, and many of our street names are the same as the street names in London, England. Uh, we do have a Thames River that falls uh, that follows through the city. Uh, the university where I teach, as you see pictured uh, here, uh, has approximately 40,000 students. We have a lot of international students, approximately 12% come from uh, other countries around the world. Uh, so we always welcome students from India uh, who do very well in our programs and we're excited uh, when we do have international students from your country. We have uh, 11 uh, faculties and I am involved in the Faculty of Health Sciences that has these six schools. Uh, my home school is kinesiology and that's where I teach sport management. Our faculty itself has approximately 4,500 students and these are both undergraduate as well as graduate students. The physical therapy, occupational therapy, therapy and communication sciences um, are graduate programs, but the other three offer both undergraduate and graduate. We have uh, two unique centers uh, within our School of Kinesiology. And Dr. Ushaner had the opportunity to visit our campus back in 2000 and uh, did visit uh, the Canadian Center for Activity and Aging. It's unique in our country. It promotes physical activity and the well being of older adults. And it does that uh, by providing uh, basic and applied research. So we have professors and students doing research with our older adults. Uh, the older adults are provided with educational resources and they participate 
and physical activity programs that are offered every day. Um, a lot of our own students in kinesiology are involved in delivering these programs. And it's just been an outstanding research and community-based um, center for our university uh, since the 1980s. We also have uh, the International Center for Olympic Studies, uh, which is really the largest research center outside of Lausanne, Switzerland. And this particular center is full of educational resources. We have um, lots of um, uh, items on display in the center from uh, Olympic and Paralympic Games. Our students can visit the center, uh, sit and work in there and use the resources. We have a lot of graduate students uh, currently doing work in this particular center. It's open to the public for anybody to come and visit and to uh, tap into some of these resources as well. So I'd like to move along now and just give um, a very uh, short snapshot of sport globally. Uh, we all know that there has been a huge increase in the size of the sport industry. Of course, it's larger in some countries than others, but the reason for this interest um, has been a huge increase in opportunities for both participation and spectatorship, not only for the traditional segments of the population, but for an increased uh, diverse um, uh, group of people. This slide just shows the, uh, the increase um, in the number of, um, uh, in the whole industry around the world. Um, so continues to go up, uh, as does the, uh, the sport apparel. Um, and then when you look at uh, here for an example, uh, sorry, uh, you'll just see some of the larger um, sporting goods companies and how they have become so successful because of the sheer number of people around the world who are participating uh, in sport. Of course, India, you are, are very successful in hosting events. Uh, we'll, uh, I know that you are continuing to put uh, bids in to host international events, but uh, it's not all about hosting. And, and bringing sport to your country, it's obviously advancing and making sport available uh, to all sectors of society. And you'll see how uh, there's been some growth um, over the years uh, in your country, uh, which really mirrors what is happening uh, in a lot of other countries around the world. So we know that there are a lot of factors that influence sport um, and leisure. And if we take, for example, what's going on now, the COVID-19 pandemic is a, a, a great example because uh, there have been all sorts of restrictions put in place and physical activity uh, has been curtailed in the formal sense. Uh, in the way of clubs and leagues and regular programming. Uh, a lot of these things um, are still closed and um, not yet opened. Uh, we do have uh, other things that have happened this past year, such as political protests in various countries. Um, and look to Hong Kong as an example. Uh, that had an impact um, on sport. Uh, we have, um, unfortunately, uh, wars going on in, in certain uh, regions of the world that has a huge impact. Um, and then we have um, uh, environmental things happening. The bushfires in Australia certainly had an impact uh, in some of those regions. So uh, a huge number of factors can uh, impact what's going on in everyday society. So what I'd like to do is provide um, a picture 
of how sport is organized in Canada and then share with you uh, just some of the programs that we have in operation. Uh, sport uh, is uh, and falls under a federal department in our country and it's called Canadian Heritage and Dr. Darlene Kluka talked a little bit about uh, the placement of sport in a country and in many countries it's not just on its own and that's the case with Canadian heritage. It's not just sport, uh, it includes um, culture, uh, art, uh, languages, those sorts of things. So uh, the federal government gives money to um, uh, an organization called Sport Government. So the federal government is the larger, largest investor in sport and then Sport uh, Canada receives that money and it op operates its programming such as the hosting program if we have national games such as Canada Games, uh, if we are sending athletes to international competitions uh, such as the Commonwealth Games, the Pan American Games, or the Olympic and Paralympic Games. Uh, the Sports Services Program includes all of our uh, national, provincial, um, and territorial uh, governing bodies, and our Athlete Assistance Program provides financial support uh, for our elite athletes to help them throughout the year as they train uh, because they are not in a position to be employed uh, full time. We have 55 national sport organizations. These are all non-profit uh, and they include um, uh, examples such as Field Hockey Canada and in our country, we certainly make a distinction between uh, field hockey and ice hockey because ice hockey is such a large and important um, aspect um, uh, to um, our, our society. Uh, cricket, I've already mentioned, tennis, uh, so a whole variety of them. U uh, Sports is the national governing body for inter-university or what um, is also known as intercollegiate sport in Canada. So 56 of our approximately 100 universities in the country offer um, elite competitive sport at the university level. And we have four regional conferences that the universities fit into. Um, and they're broken up according to geography. So Canada West um, includes British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. Uh, we have uh, a separate one for the province of Ontario just due to sheer population. The RSEQ is for the province of Quebec, uh, primarily French speaking, but also English speaking universities in um, Montreal uh, and we have the Atlantic University sport for the uh, provinces that are in eastern Canada. So this governing body uh, will offer the national team championships for intercollegiate sport. We also have many multi-sport organizations. Um, the list you can see that uh, uh, on the screen, and I just uh, like to talk about each one very briefly. Athletes Can uh, uh, is led by a lot of um, retired national team athletes, and it provides an opportunity for leadership development. But Athletes Can is really the uh, advocating voice for an athlete-centered sport system. So this is the voice of the athletes. And these athletes can take their thoughts and their opinions to the decision makers and have a huge influence on policy, generation, uh, decisions with um, 
selection and other programming that is put in place. We have the Canadian Centre for Ethics and Sport, and this works on behalf of the whole segment of athletes, coaches, parents, officials, and administrators, but it is our national anti-doping agency. But within our Canadian Centre for Ethics and Sport, we have a lot of different programs, and I could spend the entire talk uh, just speaking to one of these in particular. There is just so much that's going on uh, with each one of these. To give you an example, uh, this particular uh, portfolio and group, the Sex and Gender Diversity, that falls within the uh, center, is spending a lot of time uh, currently looking at um, uh, transsexual participants and coming up with a Canadian sport policy. So it's not so much about um, getting <clears throat> women and girls active. We have other groups uh, looking at that, <clears throat> but uh, different groups um, within uh, the gendered population. And as I mentioned, this is a good example of um, a current focus. The Coaching Association of Canada's been around uh, since 1974. Um, as you can see, it deals with education, certification, and recognition. So I know many of you uh, listening today are community coaches, your physical education teachers who also coach in the school system as well, um, and our coaches in the schools as well as in the community <clears throat> go through uh, one of the programs that's offered, the National Coaching Certification Program, there are sport-specific ones, and uh, it's uh, an opportunity uh, to provide uh, education, certification, and recognition. So we've had a lot of coaches um, or individuals take advantage of getting themselves certified so that they are current with the knowledge and the research that's going on. Uh, the National Coaching Certification Program has streams for those individuals who are most interested in being involved in coaching community sport. Another stream would be for those interested in um, highly competitive sport. And then the third would be those more uh, interested in instructional. So you can see how it would span teachers um, in the formal education system as well as instructors outside of the formal education system. Um, another aspect, uh, diversity and inclusion. And we have a, a focus in uh, various uh, segments uh, such as uh, women in coaching. Again, I could talk for um, the whole hour about that particular one or Aboriginal, uh, LGBTQ, um, coaching athletes with uh, disabilities, uh, coaching masters athletes, those who want to continue um, competing after their uh, formal uh, competitive uh, time. Another multi-sport uh, uh, organization is called Canadian Women in Sport. Now, uh, there was a name change February 20th, so just a few months ago. This used to be called the Canadian Association for the Advancement of Women in Sport, and the acronym for that is CAUSE. But uh, the rebranding of it um, occurred, but uh, there's always been a recognition. This organization's been around um, since 1981, uh, there's been a recognition that girls and women are underrepresented and underserved in Canadian sport. It is still happening, <clears throat> but this group uh, provides lots of programming to uh, try to tackle uh, this issue of underrepresentation and to get more leaders involved as coaches, 
to increase participation of various groups, so uh, diverse groups, so hooking into um, uh, immigrant groups, uh, uh, getting girls and women involved, those who might be disabled or who have special learning challenges, uh, Paralympic athletes, uh, those sorts. So you could see interconnectedness here. And uh, the organization uh, really keeps as its cornerstone uh, equity as being the, uh, the direction that it wants to focus on. Aboriginal Sports Circle. This is our national voice uh, for our First Nations, uh, Inuit and Métis people who are our Aboriginal uh, segment uh, of the population. And uh, a lot of uh, our kinesiology researchers do spend a lot of time um, uh, with groups in Northern Canada or in parts of Canada where there is a large population of these three particular groups and helping them with their programming as well. As I indicated, our country's broken up into provinces and territories, so we also have uh, sport organizations um, such as um, what you see here on Ontario Volleyball, Ontario Basketball, through the whole realm of sports. One of them uh, that I wanted to highlight, because many of you are physical education teachers, perhaps in high schools, and <clears throat> this provincial organization has been going for a long time. Uh, education in our country is under the provincial and territorial jurisdictions. So they're the decision makers. Uh, within the province where I live, which is Ontario, we have 18 regional high school athletic associations. And in the high schools, students have an opportunity to participate on competitive teams. Uh, so the physical education teachers, for the most part, are the ones who are the coaches. There are teachers from other subjects who could be coaches as well. But this particular organization hosts the Ontario Championships and um, links into the regional um, or, uh, athletic associations as well. And then we have community sport uh, that involves people who are not necessarily um, gearing themselves towards uh, elite competition. So obviously this is the largest segment of those participating in sport uh, at the grassroots level. And these organizations exist um, across um, all segments uh, in our country. And in the city where I live, we have a sports council and uh, it's involved in creating policy and organizing um, lots of uh, sport activities uh, if we're hosting as example or uh, putting on uh, various competitions. Sport is important in Canada but we have lots of um, debate about issues such as this one. Uh, should funding be directed more towards competitive sport or should we put more money into recreational sport? So elite versus grassroots. It's a philosophical question. And elite sport in Canada gets a lot of media attention when there's an international event going on, such as the Olympic and Paralympic Games, the uh, Commonwealth Games, Pan American Games. But aside from that, elite sport doesn't get as much attention. And some would argue that our uh, very best competitive athletes are not supported financially to the extent that they should be. So huge debate about that. Uh, this one uh, uh, pertains in particular to, I know a lot of the audience today, quality daily physical education has not happened in my lifetime. It has been uh, an issue that will continue to be an issue. Um, we know that uh, we would like to have a minimum 
of 30 minutes each day provided to all students uh, from kindergarten to grade 12 throughout the school year. It is not happening. We have advocacy groups um, such as People for Education and the statistics that they uh, have provided recently is that in my province, uh, only 45% of our schools have a specialized physical education teacher. Um, and that would be at the elementary school level. At the high school level, we always do have specialized physical education teachers, but that's not necessarily the case at the elementary primary school level. And only 25% uh, at maximum have daily physical education. So some would argue, oh, you know, it's, a, it's an issue of um, uh, we don't have time in the school day. We don't have the physical activity space. Um, we, we don't have the money. But uh, to many of us, that's a cop out. What we need to do is have a shift in the priorities and an attitudinal change that um, a, a child cannot be successful in their academics unless they are physically active. And so if we change that mindset, and lots of people have been trying to change that mindset over decades. So it's not just something that's happening recently, but I would say what is happening more recently are um, pilot projects uh, in the school system to try to deal with this, such as having exercise breaks um, interspersed throughout um, a mathematics class. So uh, if students have, for instance, 45 minutes of mathematics, then um, every so many minutes, take a quick exercise break at the desk, standing up, doing some exercises, um, uh, maybe uh, not using chairs at desks, but using exercise balls, having um, uh, activities over the, uh, the lunch hour. We, we have recess, which is that break time for students, but having more physical activity uh, during that time. Uh, so there would be individuals who would say, uh, don't um, make excuses for our students doing poorly in a particular subject such as mathematics. Uh, the problem is they need more physical activity and if they had more physical activity, maybe they would do better in some of these subjects such as mathematics. So I can't emphasize enough uh, the importance of having um, quality and quality means having specialized trained physical educators uh, delivering the programs but we can educate people who are not formally educated in that to deliver quality and to have a daily physical education our canadian uh, sport policy uh, every so many years we have a new one uh, we have one in place for 10 years that's going to end in a couple of years, and then we'll have a new sport policy. But these are what are called the pillars of our current sport policy. And um, just draw attention to the last one, sport for development, which has taken um, a real um, front seat in recent years, using sport uh, to um, uh, have uh, positive social change. Uh, so a lot of programming has gone uh, uh, on and been developed for this. Um, the right to play is an example of every child should have an opportunity to be involved and uh, in play and therefore there should be programs in place to allow uh, children who are disadvantaged or maybe disabled or from um, a group that is um, a very uh, small segment of the population to have that opportunity. Sport and physical activity participation, getting 
and keeping people active is really important uh, globally, so not just in our country. We have this worldwide problem. Uh, the word globesity is often used because it is uh, such a, a prominent international problem and the statistics uh, for the future are very frightening. Uh, and all sorts of agencies and um, uh, organizations that provide st statistics uh, might come up with with different ones uh, than what I've got on the, uh, the slide here, but uh, physical activity uh, is uh, um, a global problem. The World Health Organization uh, provides some very frightening statistics about uh, the percentages of adults and children uh, who are overweight or obese and we, all of us here today, um, are advocates of uh, physical activity and, and sport. Um, and we can certainly play a huge role in this um, world health issue. Uh, we all know the reasons um, why this is happening. And uh, we know, um, as educated people, that obesity is preventable. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, shifts in uh, leisure. Uh, it's no longer just outside of the home. We see a lot uh, more screen time. So uh, everybody uh, uh, from the whole span of ages spending more time in front of a screen uh, than they ever used to with the increase uh, in technology. Uh, we have, um, uh, with social media, uh, a more confident um, population, um, but we should take advantage of technology where ideas can be spread uh, that much easier and, and quicker. Uh, with respect to, uh, we see activities such as esports. This is huge globally now. But again, sitting in, in front of a, of, of a screen, uh, we see a lot of um, uh, people setting up uh, equipment in their own homes. So again, that you don't have to go outside to play or have physical activity, or you don't have to go to a gym or a field to play um, uh, hockey or cricket, that you can do activity in the home. Um, we have uh, a lot of attention, uh, more attention being paid to uh, getting kids uh, and a youth active, uh, females, just one segment of the population. Uh, so uh, in terms of diversity, it's not just uh, the, the gendered group. Technology has played a huge role in getting people involved. Uh, uh, you can wear things, watches, and even clothing will give you um, data about uh, your, your exercise, your, your distance, how much uh, uh, your heart rate is changing, your blood pressure, those sorts of things, virtual training. So um, these devices are available, obviously, at a cost, so not everybody can uh, have the luxury of purchasing some of these um, uh, technology devices, but they're certainly out there and having a huge impact on sport. When we look at how one spends one time, one's time, um, I, I know there's a lot of countries listed here, but um, this particular table um, is put together uh, by the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, and it uh, breaks the day up according to uh, unpaid work, paid work or study, so it could be a student, personal care, um, and time for exercise and, and leisure, and then other things. And the top part of each of um, uh, the bars represent the, the leisure time in a day. So the, the bottom would be the unpaid work in the darkest color, and then next would be the paid work. 
Um, and so I think the point is here, um, you can analyze personally how much time, how many hours you actually spend on uh, your own physical activity and ask yourself, is it enough according to the physical activity guidelines? We know when we compare uh, gender uh, that there's a gap. Men usually have more free time than women because women um, globally tend to be the caregivers for children and would have uh, less time uh, and opportunity uh, for physical activity. Many women are working um, outside the home and also at home taking care of children. Uh, we know that um, uh, older adults, when they are no longer working, often have more time than those who are working full time. Uh, and we do have in our own country uh, physical activity guidelines. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on each of these slides, but uh, we've broken it down according to age um, and give and provided recommended amounts of time uh, according to age segments. So this being zero to four years of age, uh, this being five to 11 years. So say uh, the number of minutes per day and how many days a week as well. Uh, when, and so this is when you're starting your formal schooling. So think about quality daily physical education and uh, uh, how kids can be active. 12 to 17 years, usually the, um, uh, the high school age uh, category. Uh, so we're expecting students to be, or children to be more active, more uh, time spent throughout the week. And then we've got uh, a huge range from 18 to 64 years uh, and when we're looking at 150 minutes of uh, moderate to vigorous intensity um, it's quite frightening when we look at our own Canadian statistics um, as to how we are not meeting that and then we've got older adults uh, I mentioned our Canadian Center for Activity and Aging uh, in our School of Kinesiology um, at my university. And it's an excellent program to get these individuals. It actually um, services individuals even younger than age 65 um, who can participate in programming. We all know this is not uh, rocket science, so to speak, that there's a huge economic impact uh, if people are not healthy, uh, it, it can lead to uh, uh, health issues such as uh, diabetes, uh, heart disease, high blood pressure, stroke, a whole uh, variety of health issues, and that contributes to the costs of the healthcare system. Uh, so this is not a good statistic for Canadian adults, only 15% getting the recommended number of minutes. We've got lots of stakeholders involved uh, in this uh, issue, uh, and therefore we're working towards providing programming to address um, this particular issue. So um, I'm not sure if any of you have um, uh, seeing this, it's uh, circulated globally, I know. Uh, used to be a huge concern for smoking, but now the concern is people are in front of a computer screen or their laptop uh, much longer than uh, they ever used to be before technology became so sophisticated. And we need to address the fact that people are sitting more and they need to be getting up and and moving. Uh, so we know that uh, those who have more education tend to have a higher pay if they are working and they tend therefore to have the financial capacity to perhaps participate in more 
formal, uh, formalized sport by joining clubs or have opportunities to be active. So um, education, income, and uh, whether one is employed full-time, part-time, or unemployed. So uh, a lot more frightening if someone doesn't have an income to uh, buy equipment, to participate in sport. Of course, there are activities that you can do just by walking that doesn't take anything but a pair of comfortable shoes. We know that students have a lot of opportunity um, certainly at our universities and colleges for uh, joining sport clubs and participating in intramural sports. Uh, those who are more competitive and more skilled can participate uh, in more elite teams, uh, the intercollegiate teams. Uh, therefore, Canadian sport has really focused in the last um, uh, number of years on physical literacy and long-term athlete development. So getting kids active from an early age, giving them the skill set and the confidence to make sure that what they're participating in is fun. Because if it's not fun, it's not going to be sustainable. So it's very important to provide opportunities uh, throughout the lifespan so that people can be active throughout uh, the various stages of one's life. And we have a number of organizations in Canada that I'm just going to spend a short time talking about. This one is called Participation, uh, comes from the words participation, of course, and action. It's been around since 1971. It's a national nonprofit organization and it uh, is focused on promoting healthy living and physical fitness. And it was launched um, that many years ago in response to the poor physical fitness of Canadians. And at that time, there was a report that came out that compared the fitness of Canadians to people in Sweden. And we rated very, very poorly and it was a national embarrassment. And because of that, participation was formed. Uh, the vision is that physical activity is an important part of everyday life and uh, that it is our uh, most important physical activity brand in the country and uh, really uh, trying to come up with innovative ideas that are changing every year and taking advantage, for example, of digital, digital platforms and social media and those sorts of things. So there are programs geared towards the school system and parents um, to companies that have employees to governments and uh, to Canadians as individuals. So those sectors of society. Uh, there's a lot of television uh, uh, advertisements that have been on over the years since 1971. Uh, these are public service announcements, but um, they have um, uh, really kept participation uh, at the forefront of the minds of Canadians because they associate some of these ads and um, now that has transitioned with technology <clears throat> to providing uh, apps and uh, YouTubes and, and national programs. So this is an example of a program in the workplace called Up and Go. So get up and get moving. So get up and go is ba basically what it's focused on. Sit less, move more at work. So uh, there are programming opportunities through this particular program that's operated by participation 
and it provides um, education and resources for companies and organizations for their employees. Program supports, monthly themes, digital platforms uh, with um, uh, achievable goals, such as um, having opportunities during lunch breaks um, uh, to have programming in place, um, stand-up desks. So a lot of our university uh, faculty members and staff are requesting that they have a stand-up desk now that can be raised and lowered. So during the day, you can sit and uh, use your computer computer and work there or maybe you want to stand and work at your computer and there has been financial support at our university to pay for a new desk for an employee if they wish to have one so that's an example of an initiative so uh, physical activity obviously helps employees work better um, in these aspects uh, of focusing, thinking, learning, creating, and leading. So again, this parallel um, quality daily physical education, because if you have students who are physically active, and uh, they can think better, and they can do may, uh, perhaps better in their mathematics or their English or their science courses, if they, um, uh, if their brain is clear and they have had some physical activity. So it parallels the workplace. So when we look at children, um, uh, the most recent uh, investigation of children's physical activity in Canada uh, that was done by participation compared our children to other countries around the world. And we did not receive um, a very good score. Uh, so uh, not even 10% of our children in our country get the recommended 60 minutes of activity per day. And that could be both obviously within the school system as well as outside. Um, people have long used the argument in our country that oh, uh, in the winter it's hard to uh, be physically act active because we have snow and the roads aren't very good and the fields are covered. Uh, that's, that's an excuse, as well as high screen time in front of a, um, uh, a computer. What has to change is the attitude and we have to place more value on sport and physical activity. Uh, and we don't do that. So participation, has, um, as I said, been instrumental in coming up with um, programs. This is another example called the 150 Playlist, and it was um, done in the year 2017. Uh, they came up with 100 events across the, uh, the country and came up with 150 uh, things that one could do to be active, and of course, it would vary according to where one lives in the country. So if one lives in the extreme north where it is colder and there is more snow, then maybe those physical activities would be uh, more outside than they would be indoors. But there were digital platforms that were uh, created and all sorts of opportunities to um, have challenges uh, across the country. So in my province, some of these activities are, are listed here. And then in one of the northern territories of our country, you can see the uh, activities were more related to the weather, the environment, where dog sledding and building snow forts and building um, an igloo, which is um, uh, the uh, the house or the dwelling of our um, northern Inuit uh, communities. We have a program by participation participation called the Teen Challenge, and getting teenagers cha uh, challenged to be active because, as we know, uh, they're inter uh, very much interested in 
working uh, on their computers and spending more time in front of the, the screen. So a great group to focus on. Uh, this Build Your Best Day was for younger children uh, to create a, what in a 24 hour day could incorporate um, uh, physical activity along with school and other things that would um, be uh, an everyday activity. And then the focus on making communities better and having a competition, and hence the word the challenge there. Uh, so having competitions between the communities across the country. And this is an example of um, uh, community leaders and, and small communities competing with large communities and they don't have to be large cities and taking up the challenge and various um, programs and um, uh, assistance that could be provided for the community challenge and tracking one's physical activity digitally. Uh, so participation does have a plan in place uh, for the current years, it's ending this year and they'll come up with another strategic plan, but it's to take the uh, inactive individual um, in the worst uh, health situation and, and get them active uh, and to try to move people towards some achievable uh, behavioral uh, goals with um, some targets that they can work towards. Uh, kids sport, uh, sometimes kids don't have the financial capacity to participate. So this national program in our country does provide um, uh, programming and financial assistance uh, to get these kids active. There are chapters across the, the country and there's uh, three ways to get involved. You can um, apply for a grant uh, to have um, a local chapter in your community. So you can get money from this organization to help support kids in your community who do not have the money to get involved. Uh, there's an opportunity for people to donate money to this cause and to provide uh, financial assistance. And then there's an opportunity to volunteer and help with the kids' involvement in physical activity. So an example here of um, a provincial chapter, they did a dodgeball tournament for kids um, a year ago. And in my city, they had a golf tournament for kids. So these would be kids who would never have the financial capacity uh, through their family situation to get involved and they're able to get involved. And th the last um, program that I'd like to just share with you is what's called Canadian Sport for Life. It's a movement uh, to improve the quality of sport and physical activity in our country and it focuses on long-term athlete development stages. So taking a child from early age and uh, continuing uh, throughout the lifespan so that people are active for life. So there's different segments and different programs for each of these segments. And this is an example of cross-country skiers long-term athlete development. So along the left side, you can see um, the long-term athlete development stage. In the middle, you can see the age bracket. And then on the right-hand side, you can see who's responsible and then the type of um, program and, and the name of the program. So you can see parents being involved at very early stages and clubs and then as you go higher up into um, stages such as training to win, that's when you're going to see and training to compete those who are more interested in competitive sport. But the whole idea is to keep um, uh, Canadians involved throughout their lifespan. Uh, recognizing that um, uh, there's various factors involved here 
uh, such as if you want to be excellent in something, I know you've all heard that it um, takes 10,000 hours and I've heard that over the last few days in the various uh, presentations. Things have to be fun and um, uh, we all have a part in ensuring that we uh, encapsulate fun uh, in order to keep people engaged. So this is just a, a graphic to show uh, physical literacy, getting people um, involved at early ages um, and developing skills and learning how to move uh, with the fundamentals, but getting an active start and then keeping that going throughout one's lifetime. So we've got various um, segments and uh, resources uh, for uh, long-term athlete development. Uh, the bottom one, newcomers, we have a lot of um, new Canadians. People are immigrating from other countries, so we want to get them involved as well. We want to get our Indigenous populations. So this whole circle of physical literacy, uh, extremely, uh, important to provide motivation uh, and give uh, people confidence in being physically active and um, understanding how to do it and carry it out. Uh, so the, the lower ages and then uh, educating. Uh, we have a lot of resources for particular groups, written resources, uh, for instance, for parents, for those with disabilities, for, uh, for communities, how can communities help? We have projects going on around the, the world, in the Caribbean, uh, as an example, in St. Uh, Lucia, um, Andhra Pradesh, uh, and uh, Sport for Life Society. Uh, we have opportunities to share ideas at conferences. So we hosted an international physical literacy conference um, a year ago. And um, just in January, a Sport for Life Canadian Summit. So I'm going to just end my presentation talking a few minutes about um, the World Association for Sport Management. Uh, Dr. Nair indicated um, that I'm currently president of this organization. It was formally established in 2012. And it, in, it's really an umbrella organization for sport management associations that do exist um, around the world um, in various geographical locations. Uh, you can see those organizations uh, there on the screen with their, their logos at the bottom. But the mission of our organization is to facilitate sport management research, teaching and learning excellence and professional practice worldwide. Uh, it was established uh, because sport management as an academic discipline has become very popular uh, as uh, both an area of study and a professional occupation. Um, you as physical educators and community coaches um, are involved as sport managers and we felt the need to bring together those regional associations who have the same purpose uh, we have the North American Society for Sport Management. It was um, formed in 1985, and then along came one in Europe, as well as Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we had um, an international alliance conference for those three regional associations. Um, so when one of those associations would have its um, annual conference, then we would tie in once every three years this international alliance. But we felt that since Asia started um, uh, its own regional association um, in 2002, Latin America and Africa uh, 
formed associations and Rosa's involved in the uh, the Al Haida organization that we needed to establish uh, a global sport management academy. So we did initially meet in uh, Prague, Czech Republic um, in 2010, where we had a variety of individuals involved in discussing the idea of a global organization. You can see uh, Professor uh, Darlene Kluka um, uh, sitting with our group because she was at that initial meeting where we talked about the organization. And then we uh, luckily had um, Alethea University in Taipei, Taiwan host a global summit in 2011. And uh, this is when we um, initially uh, um, formed the association. Um, you can see uh, Rose and myself in the front, but you can see uh, people from around the world from these other regional associations. So it's really been an outstanding way to bring uh, sport uh, management uh, people together. And uh, these were the presidents of those regional associations at the time. And uh, those of us who were involved in the formal discussions uh, with, and you can see in the background, uh, the logos of those groups. Um, so we officially established um, a world body. Um, Alethea University had another summit in 2012. Uh, we talked about um, uh, and formalized uh, constitution at that meeting, and um, it's been uh, moving forward from that point um, onwards. So what have we done since 2012, and how can India become involved? <clears throat> We've held three conferences uh, in Spain, uh, 2014, Lithuania, and 2017, and just recently in Chile. We had the conference uh, in October. Our next conference is going to be in Doha, uh, Qatar in March of uh, 2022. <clears throat> so we hope and invite any of you to attend that particular conference. We have a book series. Six books have been published. We invite you to contribute to the book series. We have established uh, partnerships and uh, we provide opportunities for networking. Uh, Dr. Kluka is, uh, and Dr. Um, Lopez uh, are involved in ICSPI uh, in a very uh, strong capacity and we are a member of ICSPI. Uh, we have provided and consulted with the Sport Authority of Thailand. So perhaps the Sports Authority of India might look to um, our group to uh, assist them. Uh, we do have regional membership, uh, corporate and individual memberships. We're working on the, uh, the structure of those. So uh, the question that you might ask is how can India become involved in WASM? Uh, you can become a regional association member. So India falls within the Asian Association for Sport Management. So you as an individual or maybe your group could join the Asian Association for Sport Management. There are no fees to join the Asian Association for Sport Management, uh, but they are one of the regional members of WASM. Uh, as I indicated, you could come to the next conference as a participant, you could be a presenter, you could share with us what's going on in India in one of, your, in one of the conference presentations. It could be an oral presentation or it could be a poster presentation. You could contribute to the book series by writing an article and submit for consideration for publication. Um, you could ask us for help uh, with consultancy because we draw in a lot of our professionals and you could volunteer certainly to assist with uh, committees and any of the conferences. So 
Uh, I'm happy to connect with any one of you uh, personally to answer any questions that you might have in that regard. So my last slide, um, which really um, provides just a, a few things to think about. Um, nothing that you don't already know, uh, but uh, some ideas uh, that uh, might provoke some uh, thoughts. So it takes a village. This uh, we know is an African proverb uh, that means um, an entire community of people must interact with children for those children to experience and grow in a safe and healthy environment. And I think I've shared with you some ideas today about long-term athlete development and having quality daily physical education and why it's important and having programming in place and having educational opportunities in place for teachers and coaches to keep them current and to pass along new knowledge and new ideas for getting people active. Um, we have to have an attitudinal change and stop making excuses for why we can't do things um, because we don't have space or we don't have time, we don't have budget. We uh, have to uh, make um, physical activity and sport um, uh, a part of our daily um, um, uh, activity and, and convince people, decision makers, that physical activity is essential to learning and it's extremely important and we have to uh, make time for it in our school system. Uh, diversity and inclusion is important. Um, diversity uh, and inclusion is not just about the gendered population, girls and women and keeping them active. It's about a whole bunch of other groups, um, whether they're new immigrant groups, maybe they're um, indigenous and aboriginal groups, maybe it's those who are disadvantaged financially, maybe it's those who are disabled or those who um, have special needs. Um, so. Uh, think large uh, in terms of the word diversity. Uh, we've too long focused on too few diverse groups and we've got to think in a broader sense. And the, the last point about um, collaboration and partnerships um, really ties into that first point a bit that it takes a village, it takes people to um, uh, work together on, on these sorts of things. So um, that's the end of my presentation and I'd be happy to uh, address any questions uh, that you might have or any comments or ideas that you would like to share with the group. Thank you, Karen. I think it's been a, it's a, it's been a uh, endurance work with <laughs> your talk was very uh, uh, intuitive. But there are a few questions. So we start with the questions, please. Sanjay. First of all, thank you, ma'am, for your wonderful lecture. So we have some questions. The first question is, how we can improve physical literacy in India like Canada? Uh, well, um, I, I'm not completely familiar with uh, whether your education system requires daily physical activity through formal physical education programs. But if it does not, uh, I think my response would be that you've got to convince the decision makers of the importance of that and to have trained physical educators like yourselves um, providing leadership and whether that means that you, uh, those physical educators cannot necessarily, there can't be a designated one in each school, at least train someone properly to um, provide physical education uh, in a formal uh, sense. So whether it's just a small number of minutes uh, per day, um, I think that's just extremely important. And oftentimes, um, 
we have those of us who are convinced of it, but we have roadblocks because the decision makers sometimes take over and eliminate that opportunity. And that's the case in Canada. So if it is in your country, then you have to work on the decision makers. Thank you, ma'am. The next question, I think it is very interesting. How we improve the skill so the maximum women will take part in physical activity? The maximum number of women, I think you've got to have programs in place that are specific to uh, women and girls to make them feel comfortable uh, in an environment that is going to allow them to excel. And whether that means programming that uh, girls are participating only with girls um, and not getting um, shut out of play uh, with, with boys, uh, that is often the case uh, at younger ages. You, we have to have role models, uh, women and girls who are role models. So we've got to ensure that we develop uh, more leaders who are female so that they can be viewed by girls to see that they too can have the opportunity to become instructors and coaches um, when they get to that age that uh, they can contribute. So again, to have programming in place uh, to develop and to educate and to have resources in place as to how that can come about. So if there are not programs in place to allow this to happen, then to reach out to get assistance as to how uh, that can happen. Yeah, it's very true, ma'am. Now over to Dr. Ushaman. Uh, can you come across, like for physical activity, you come across people with almost women also with 75, 80 coming for an exercise program. When I talk about the Indian context, it's very difficult to get these women, even 60 plus or 55 plus, out to get into the exercise. So what do you suggest here? How could we have a startup with? Like, how could we initiate this project? Well, I think um, you have to have leadership. So you have to have someone to take the initiative. So without good leadership, you can come up with great ideas, but if you don't have people willing to um, carry out the ideas, then that's very difficult. So if you've got some uh, people who are willing to step to the plate and to try to uh, form some sort of programming and start small. So there, uh, I would say a pilot project uh, would need to be started. You can't look at trying to do something all over the country or all over the region. You have to start small. And if it's just a small local uh, program in a community where you've got um, um, a strong advocate with the proper resources and education and try to pr provide some sort of facility and promotion for it and and then build on that uh, as well but of course we know you need human resources and you need financial resources so perhaps government support to start a pilot project thank you i think uh, now for the we have less of time but definitely we'll put the questions to you so maybe you could send us may i now call, request uh, rosa for your rosa is rosa there rosa Yes, I'm here. I have been listening. Congratulations, Karen. It was an outstanding presentation. I really enjoyed it. Okay. Now, there is one, one question from uh, the audience related with possibilities worldwide 
to study sport management. And I think, I mean, this is your field and you, you could uh, elaborate a, a bit more about where in the world there are more places to study sport management. Well, on our uh, WASM website and um, our North American Society for Sport Management website, we provide a list of the universities uh, around the world that offer formal sport management programs at universities. So I think to tap into that list will um, provide information. So uh, those of us who are involved in teaching sport management at the university level often receive personal emails from individuals around the world asking whether they could study sport management at the graduate level, maybe do a, a master's degree or a doctoral degree. So individual personal contact uh, is always welcome. But at the undergraduate level, there are programs offered globally. There are, there are hundreds of them and um, you need to um, source out the names of those and, and then make some personal contacts. The other question, Karen, I mean, you have a wonderful range of programs in Canada. I mean, it's impressive, it's amazing. Now, in the statistic, you, you indicate, I mean, they are not good in the terms of being ha having people active. Why do you think so? I mean, the, why don't you have bigger numbers if the program looks wonderful? Well, it's, it's a real challenge. Um, uh, and it's a dilemma. It, it's a sad situation because um, from the aspect of financial capacity, many people do have financial capacity, but, uh, you know, it's a well-developed country, but we do have lots of segments of the population who, who, who don't have that financial capacity. I would say in answer to that, it's a, it's a societal issue through technology. Technology has been good, but it's also been bad because it has forced people uh, to sit more and to sit in front of a screen and to spend more time on the internet and social media. And look at us talking before we started this morning about Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn. And that all takes time to keep your accounts up and to be active. And that time takes away from physical activity. So if we didn't have all those social media outlets like we did not have many years ago, uh, then, um, and we worked on the programming that has become more sophisticated, maybe we wouldn't have such a dismal percentage. So uh, environmental um, and social factors. Uh, so technology, advantages and disadvantages. Please, look out. Your observations, please. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, Karen, this was uh, outstanding. I uh, have not had an opportunity to uh, listen and see you speak on this on these particular topics, so it was of great interest to me. So I thank you for that. Um, let me add to Karen's thoughts. Um, and Rosa had, uh, or someone from the group had a question. You know, the challenge that we have once we get out of schools, there we could theoretically make it compulsory for physical education on a daily or weekly basis. But the challenge is, and the reality is, that sport is voluntary. You have to want to include it into your daily life. 
And many times, and I know Karen knows this, uh, and that's why I'm so happy to have her as a professional friend, because she has the uh, ability to, even though she is mentally exhausted from the job that she does, she goes out and does physical activity to assist with all of that. But many people, when they are mentally exhausted, they are then also physically exhausted, and then there goes their motivation. So I'm not sure how to resolve that for people, but the more, uh, how do I say this, the more heady we get and the more mental stress we have, the more we need to be physically active. Um, Karen also mentioned beautifully having role models for girls. I want to also add, we do need the role models to be for the boys as well, meaning that they need to see girls and women be able to be successful in those areas. All right, and so uh, we have to educate the boys and men to be able to have a, a greater appreciation for what they already think is something that ought to be that boys and men should do, be physically active. And um, I also wanted to uh, add a, a little bit on uh, meetings. Uh, when we have meetings, um, sometimes it would be really interesting to see if we could have walking meetings, mm -hmm. especially when you have it with, with smaller groups, or if you put people into smaller groups to discuss things, instead of having them sitting around a table, maybe have them go out and commune with nature a little bit, and, and also be able to walk while they make business decisions or whatever it happens to be. And uh, the last uh, question, and I don't know if this would work, but um, as we look to see how can we get communities more involved, especially in India, because there's already that paradigm of uh, we need to be highly intellectual, is uh, what will it take? You ask people, what will it take for you to want to be physically active? And whether it's older folks, uh, 65 plus, what will it take? And sometimes when you ask it in that way, they will look to find an answer that they've already had within themselves, but they never really thought about it. So uh, just a, a small idea, uh, to build on uh, Karen's outstanding uh, presentation on uh, the many aspects of things that are going on, not only in Canada, but also in the nation. And uh, I also want to put a little plug in for uh, Wasam and Iapiskave. Those are two outstanding organizations that your uh, uh, your country or people in your country can truly not only benefit from, but also provide benefit to those organizations. So please consider them. Uh, obviously, I'm an XB vice president. I'd like you to consider that as well. Uh, but for the specifics of things, might be a good idea to try Wasm and Iapiskave. If the, if the government would like to have a larger look on all of sports science and physical education, XP is a good idea. Trika, may I now introduce uh, Kamada uh, Dertsma, uh, who's the High Performance Director in Sports Authority of India. For the information of Dertsma, we have uh, Professor Karen Gandhi, who's from Canada, and uh, Darling Trika, who's from the US, Piedrosa from Venezuela, and Suchit is already there. I know the family. He is also part of the coordinator. So, may I request um, Dr. Kishosa is there? Uh, may I request uh, Kamara Gertsa for your remarks, please? Indeed, they are very honored. So, before I start, so had the so is heading the high performance, and they had a sports science uh, session, which, which was almost for I think a one and a half month session which was headed by uh, Kamada Gurksa, which went on very well. They had a lot of international speakers with it. So I need to uh, thank her for having taken the initiative of, of conduct of such an event. 
and so heading the coaching section because when you talk of the sports authority of india we just don't have the academic or physical education the coaching aspect and high performance sport comes under their category so please uh, thank you dr usha for uh, the introduction it was indeed a very very nice uh, you know introduction to the to the sp uh, sport and physical education as to what is happening in canada and uh, a lot of learning uh, can be taken from there Spe specifically from uh, uh, i was very intrigued and uh, to know about participation as to what they are doing you know uh, ngo who is uh, who has uh, uh, the last 30 years have developed so well and is working so much for the benefit of the society i hope that we can have organizations like that in india and uh, you know we can we can educate our people about uh, physical fitness and uh, to be physically active also on the issue of uh, societal you know participation in sports especially in women uh, ma'am i would like to uh, tell you about uh, that the uh, very, uh, the specific groups in india Uh, especially leading women have come out and uh, you know brought, brought major changes in bringing their own uh, you know women into sports uh, specifically in the sport of shooting and in the sport of uh, wrestling and uh, communities where they were going out into the public was a big taboo you know where they they never allowed women to get out and even you know they were in sort of uh, compulsory uh, uh, what can i say there is no english word for it you know uh, with their sarees they used to keep complete you know uh, you know their faces also were not seen but those women have uh, ventured out and uh, brought their uh, daughters and sisters and all all into the sports of uh, specifically in shooting wrestling so uh, that is very commendable for that part of the society of of not bringing women but still there are large gaps in our in india because of various reasons of uh, you know uh, poverty and things like that where physical well being takes uh, uh, a second you know a uh, 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 second step and uh, normal living takes the first step so that is there but it was indeed a very very nice lecture and uh, i have made notes myself and i would be researching them further as to how we can collaborate with uh, canadian sports and you know get uh, knowledge out of that especially in the coaching section and in the, into physical education section thank you very much ma'am thank you okay thank you and we look forward to you for the next session uh just Kishore sir, uh, Sujit, I think we can make an announcement for tomorrow, the morning session, so the participants don't forget and the voter thanks, please. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, uh, Karen, it was an excellent session. I think uh, I am part of the Fit India also, uh, which is a campaign. A lot of things that you talked about, I also made my own notes actually, uh, which I probably would want to. uh check with you offline uh, post uh, this session uh, it was an excellent session i think when you look at all the chat and everything uh, people are just loving the entire session i think they are finding it very informative also and lot of things to learn both from coaching standpoint from fitness standpoint and everything uh, uh usha ma'am uh, uh, kishore sir is also there kishore sir yes, kindly sir could you just speak a few words sir kishore sir yes. yeah yeah one minute i am in the secretariat yeah. so just minute just two minutes i will come I'll get, speak to you one minute. Okay, sir. Okay, yeah, sir. We'll just hold on for a minute. We'll wait for him. Uh, Karen, I just wanted to ask one question till Kishore sir comes. Uh, see, I'm part of the Fit India initiative. You talked about the fitness protocols that you have for up to 18 years, up to 64 and 65 plus. But one number that you mentioned that only nine percent of Canada children actually get 60 minutes of play. What is the reason and why? Because you are an advanced country, unlike India, which is still a developing uh, country. What is the main reason and how? Is there some learning that we can actually imbibe from there to 
because we have uh, as a government fit india we have actually prescribed 60 minutes of play for all schools we have a concept called fit india schools and we have almost uh, 260000 schools which have become part of fit india fit india schools that's a fairly large number yes. uh, that and so we are doing a lot of initiatives for fit india schools and fit india initiatives so we'll be good to know why is it only 9% because the mission statement of 60 minutes of active play uh, if that is not I being think, uh, met in a place like canada learning uh, 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 just say why you show sir are you ready uh, karen just a minute i think it will be done yeah 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 so please sir your remarks sir you could just yeah see. am i audible yes sir your audible sir am i audible yes you yes, are audible see i am now in the secretariat i am having a meeting here government secretariat but uh, karen yeah. madam yeah, i think uh, uh, is it uh, audible to yes. madam okay. uh, it's a wonderful uh, presentation uh, we really admire canada is in the pioneers in sports and uh, we have uh, to have uh, given the inputs regarding the success of canada it's something which is eye opener for the our country we place on record our sincere appreciation uh, for to man karen for her uh, gracious presentation very informative and i just wanted to ask one question about how is the government's uh, role how is the sports uh, being promoted by canadian government how much of uh, uh, budget is earmarked and uh, also what is the machinery to link canadian sports with the various federations and how is the managerial system there whether the sports management professionals are given uh, key post or it's from the uh, maybe from uh, it's totally left to the uh, concerned federations and concerned sports association to manage if you can just give some light on this i would be great sir in zoom conference sir ha rendu work theeru vanna pa njan idilla ange theerku vanna well the as i indicated the federal government is the financial investor so they are the ones who do provide the financial resources to sport canada and sport canada then provides financial support to all of those ngos uh uh throughout the country to do their programming now uh, as i indicated uh at the provincial level we have provincial and of course territorial organizations but every time there's a new government then that portfolio may may change and may include uh other aspects uh, such as tourism and uh, arts and culture and aboriginal so the desire would be to have more of a focus um uh, from a portfolio um on sport only but unfortunately uh that's not not the case thank you so And much friend almost here you go or unbuckled around in your level you don't mean i think i will take on this question yeah, back later some more details from you uh, off the line and okay. to me thank you so much thank you teacher sir विक्टोरिया स्पोर्ट्स इन ऑस्ट्रेलिया स्पोर्ट्स so it's a very it's going to be a very interesting session and i uh, i would request all the participants to join in and they can join in through the same link which is there on the on schoolfitness.kelondia.gov button so you can just simply click on that link and join so uh, if you join at 9:30 and uh, join yeah. at 10:30 30 minutes before the session uh, so that uh, so, so that you get your you can log in easily yeah uh, Yeah, ma'am. Anything else to be conveyed to? Well, this was important because many of them get confused Saturday. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah, because we run it from Monday to Saturday till twenty ninth of uh, June, but only tomorrow we are going to have it at eleven o'clock because she is from Australia, so that's why we are going to have it in the morning. 
apart from that all the sessions all the international speaking sessions it's at 5 pm uh, india time monday to saturday uh, and the link is same so just follow the same link that you follow for the morning sessions also yeah uh, yeah so with that uh, i would like to thank uh, ms karen i think it was extremely informative session there are a lot of takeaways uh, for us uh, in india so i have made my notes i'm going to contact you on behalf of fit india as well as uh, because there are a lot of things that we are doing in fit india so want to check with that the other thing that i want to also contact you is also for putting a coaching framework we are actually looking at the coaching framework of different countries so that we can have a certification program so these are two concrete things that we would want to talk to you about and understand it a bit more uh, post this thing and uh, so it has been an extremely uh, useful session for everyone and i would like to thank uh, ms darlin uh, ms rosa uh, pushpinder sir kishore sir uh, and also usha ma'am and to all the participants who have been who have come back the second day thank you so much thank you namaste 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 from me. see you thank tomorrow you. morning see you, see you tomorrow <laughs> yeah thank, thank you. you namaste namaste, namaste. Thank you.